advocate for or against ERA legislation. In keeping with its mission to foster curiosity, encourage further inquiry, and promote an understanding of diverse perspectives, the Museum of Durham History provides a platform for the Durham community to come together and discuss issues welcoming civil discourse, divergent perspectives. The relevance of this topic in today's society, as well as its relevance to our current exhibit within the museum's organization, organizational values, I might have cut it off, sorry. Okay. At this time, I'm gonna introduce our panelists and then we will get started with some questions. And we'll be keeping an eye out for questions from you all in the audience as well. I'll be checking the chat and the team at Museum of Durham History will be looking at Q&A and our Facebook page, the Museum of Durham History Facebook page. Today's panel is a diverse group of NC activists, including Mandy Carter, a Durham-based lesbian activist with a history of social, racial, and LGBTQ plus justice organizing since 1967. She's a member of North Carolina Now and is actively engaged with the organizing efforts of the ERA North Carolina Alliance. Arlene Rocky is an NC attorney and attorney of record for the Equal Means Equal Amicus Brief. Lori Bunton is co-president of the ERA NC Alliance. She shares the presidency with Jimmy Cochran Pratt. Barbara Lau is executive director of the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice, a national historic landmark site here in Durham that honors the legacy of activist, lawyer, poet, and priest, the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray. Kamala Lopez, who you may recognize from the film, is a filmmaker, actress, and activist. She's also president of the pro ERA organization, Equal Means Equal, and the lead plaintiff in a federal lawsuit to protect ratification of the ERA. You can find more complete biographies of each of our panelists on the Museum of Durham History website. All right, we're gonna get started. We'll start with Kamala. Is Kamala here? Yes, I'm oh, here. Oh, good, hi. Can you see me? <laughs> hi. What prompted you to work on the documentaries Equal Means Equal and Legalize Equality? Well, it's, it's interesting because I, like 96% of Americans, believe that women already had equal rights. <laughs> so, um, and I had graduated from an Ivy League school. I really thought I was uh, a big shot. I made my first movie. It was at the Smithsonian. And I was walking through the lobby of the Smithsonian and there was a woman dressed in full suffrage gear. And I looked at her and I thought, gosh, I better go over and you know, see what's going on with this. And I said, hi, who are you? And she said, my name is Alice Paul and I'm back to haunt you because you've done nothing to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment and women still don't have equal rights in this country. And I just couldn't believe it. I, it literally took me two months to believe that because I had been brought up as so many generations that came of age after 1982 or after 1979 that just believed the ERA was ratified simply because it had been passed by Congress and signed by the president. So I think that sort of our lack of understanding of civics <laughs> ended up biting us because I had no idea that we didn't have equal rights. And so at that moment, I realized that women had been gaslit on a massive scale and that this gaslighting was dangerous. It was leading to four women dying every single day at the hands of an intimate partner. It was leading to pregnant women being dismissed in their eight and a half month with no recourse. It was leading to one in three freshman girls potentially being sexually assaulted on campus with 99% of, of, of perpetrators going unpunished. And I realized this was an existential issue for the feminist community and building our entire 
framework of progress on the 14th Amendment was a terrible mistake in my, in my estimation. And of course, hindsight is 2020. And so I wasn't there to make those decisions and those deals that were made that, um, that put ERA to the side and decided to move forward with legislation that doesn't have the binding quality of a constitutional amendment. Thank you. And I should have said welcome. <laughs> um, next, we'll talk with Arlene. Arlene, what is happening at the federal level now that 38 states have ratified the amendment? Um, can you see me? Because, okay, there I am. Okay. Um, at, so, first, I just like to explain that it does take 38 states in the United States at present to get um, an amendment uh, ratified. So, and the ratification process is set out in the Constitution. So initially Congress proposes an amendment and then it gets sent to the state. And there's a, only two things they can say to the states of how they can, the method of how they can ratify. They can either have like a constitutional con convention or each legislature can vote in their own legislature for, among the states. So on January 27th, 2020, Virginia was the last state Yesterday was the one-year anniversary, and unfortunately, oh no, our lane froze. Apparently, we had oh, she's uh, back. Donald Trump in the White House, and go back up to the second and say in 2012. And did I did I cut out? Can you hear me? You did cut out, but you're back. I'm sorry. What was the last thing you heard? Unfortunately. Okay, okay. Unfortunately, we had Donald Trump in the White House and Bill Barr as head of the Justice Department. And so um, I just want to back up one minute and say that in 2012, um, Representative Maloney sent a letter to the Archivist of the United States, and the Archivist's job is to publish amendments to the Constitution. So after it's ratified, that's, he's, he's ordered to do that, to publish it. So he told Congressman Maloney um, that, that he would publish it after 38 states ratified, and that was in 2012. So then the feminist movement got all excited, especially Kamala, and she um, helped, and they got three more states. So that was the 38 that they needed. So what happened was, is that just before, when they thought that the um, Virginia was about to ratify, the... Um, Justice Department put out a memorandum of law, and it said that the archivist was not allowed to publish this amendment because of the deadline that was in it. And most of y'all know that there was a deadline written in the amendment, but the thing is, is that it wasn't put in the text, the quoted text of the amendment. And it was in what they call the preamble. So um, many legal scholars, including all the attorney generals in those three states, um, who started one lawsuit and then equal means equal filed another lawsuit um, in Massachusetts and um, every all the legal scholars including myself understand that the deadline is unconstitutional and it's unconstitutional now and it was unconstitutional when it was done so that means it was void from the beginning so therefore there legally is no deadline so right now, we have a situation where we have a president who has supported the ERA for decades. And what we're trying to do now is to get the president to just direct the archivist to publish the memo. I mean, publish the amendment, excuse me. And um, he could do that. He just, I don't know if he wants to do another executive order or whatever, but there's been a big campaign by Equals Means Equal um, online tried to get the president to ratify and we tried really hard to get him to do it. Not, not to ratify, but to publish. And we tried really hard to get him to do it by yesterday, the one year amendment, I mean, one year anniversary. And I, I was very disappointed yesterday that he didn't do that. But anyway, there's still people working on that. So the other thing that's going on is that, 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 um, the day after, uh, President Biden was inaugurated, 
the House and the Senate introduced two laws, two resolutions, to try to repeal the deadline. And I understand that you're getting action notices to write to your senators and our senators and um, tell them to support the bill. So what I hope is that, and we do have, there's some people working on this, but what I hope is, is that it gets in, in markup, that it gets fixed. Because number one, the deadline, it's, it's very unlikely that the deadline can be constitutionally repealed. And number two, they don't have to repeal the deadline. Oh no, you froze in a critical moment. They don't have to because repeal the deadline. And if they Arlene, say Arlene, deadline. Arlene, you froze. Oh, okay. What did it last? What did I last say that you heard? You said you they don't have to repeal the deadline. Okay. They don't have to repeal the deadline because it, it is unconstitutional. And the problem with having a deadline being repealed is that if you're repealing something, obviously you're saying it existed in the first place. And the legal scholars don't think it even existed in the first place because it was unconstitutional. What the Congress needs to do, and it's pretty simple, they just need to validate and say this is this amendment is now the 28th Amendment. They just need to validate it. And the key to that is to put in the resolution that there, the vitality of the principle that uh, people are equal based on sex, the very the phrase that is in the Equal Rights Amendment in the first section, um, that, that that vitality has remained up until the time that it took to get the 38 states. And that's, so that's what I think needs to be in the resolution and hopefully we will get it in the resolution at some point before they um, do. So well, I just want to jump in while she's frozen to okay. say now that, if oh, the Arlene president goes ahead and tells the archivist to publish in the archivist pub that is a hello. You froze for a while. I just want to just quickly say that if the archivist publishes the amendment, that gives it presumed validity when it comes to a question about the deadline. Until the amendment is published, it really is still sort of floating in limbo. And that's why we have to focus on that so that when all these other actions happen, the basic thing has been sort of stamped as done because it really was done on the 27th of last year, but because the stamp didn't happen, it's still in a strange legal purgatory that has to be resolved before we end up in court and that becomes some kind of a confusion or an issue or a problem. Right. Can you hear me now? Can yes. you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So all I want I all I want to add to that, because that's one of the things I started to say when I went blank apparently. Um, is that after it is published in the Constitution, then Congress could also come in and do a resolution saying that it is valid and that the vitality remains until the date that Virginia ratified. And that would be all it takes. And they did that before with the 27th Amendment that took over 200 years to get ratified. It did not have a deadline, but still there was an issue it's sort of the reason behind a deadline, which is that the issue, the political principle in the amendment has to remain vital, alive, um, until the date it's ratified. So they they rubber stamped and said the 27th was valid. So that's, that's where we are. Thank you, Arlene. I want to take a moment to mention that those of you who are in attendance will be receiving an information document with all the information we've talked about here today. You're welcome to read it, share it with others, reach out with questions via the Museum of Durham History website. Next, I'm gonna to go to Lori. What efforts have been taken to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment in North Carolina? And what is North Carolina's role going forward now that the required 38 states have ratified? I thanks. Um, so, you know, we, we, the ERA, North Carolina Alliance, has, has been around now for um, a good almost five years. Uh, it was actually launched in 2016. And the goal of the Alliance, uh, after it unified major women's advocacy groups, was to call for the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment in North Carolina, as well as working on passage 
in our nation. Um, we had high hopes to be the 36th, 37th, then the 38th state. Uh, now we're working to be the, the 39th. Um, we had the very first bills were uh, submitted in March of 2015 by Senators Floyd McKissick uh, and Terry Van Dyne and Representative Carla Cunningham. We submitted again in February of 2017. In March of uh, 2017, after Nevada ratified, they filed um, S-782 and H-1072 in the short summer session. In 2019, once again, we introduced new bills. You're getting a theme here? None of the bills received a vote on the floor or a hearing in the committee. We even put a bill uh, that was filed in 2020, short session. So for those of you not from North Carolina, we have this really interesting way that we do our legislative uh, sessions. We have a long session, which is our odd years, and this is what we're in now, and a short session. Um, again, hello, COVID ruins everything, but the bills weren't uh, brought to the floor or even out of committee in 2020. So here we are in January of 2021. And exciting because we had a press conference on the 21st, introduce our bill sponsors for the ratification bills in the North Carolina General Assembly. And in fact, those bills were dropped yesterday, Senate Bill 15 and House Bill 8. So we have Senators Valerie Fushi, Natalie Murdoch, Natasha Marcus for the Senate bills. And in the House, we have Representative Julie Von Hafen, Susan Fisher, and Carla Cunningham is our lead sponsors. We have a goal of getting every single Democrat to sign on as co-sponsors, and we are reaching strongly to our Republican colleagues and asking them as well. We're asking all pro-equality North Carolina citizens to call your senators and reps and ask them to be co-sponsors of these bills. We have 24 hours from yesterday just for the Senate to become co-sponsors. We have till about, I think, Friday at noon for our House representatives. And my plea is it's time for North Carolina to be on the right side of history. And, you know, really refusing to ratify can go beyond embarrassing a state. I mean, you know, non-ratification can pack a punch just like ratification. North Carolina didn't ratify the right for women to vote until 1971. We believe that when the ERA is finally embedded in the constitution, that states rejecting it are going to feed an inequality mindset that might lie bare, really laying bare two cultural Americas for women, ratified and non-ratified states. Our own Senator Fushi said in a uh, interview that equality has to be indeliably protected in the nation's most powerful document to guarantee that future lawmakers are unable to revise the country's stance. North Carolina does not have an ERA in its own constitution as 25 other states do. The Alliance, the ERA coalition, along with Equal Means Equal, believe we should push for all 50 states to ratify, which sends a powerful message to the men and women of this country that we are all equal under the law. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Our next question is for Mandy. How would the ERA impact the LGBTQIA community? How will African American women be impacted by the amendment? Right. Well, first of all, talk about timing, great timing. And thank you, Lori. I wish I had my ERA button and also my round, I'm sorry, but you can see the sign behind me be about the issue of 50 years after Selma, the importance of voting. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here wondering and realizing that as a woman of color, who's a lesbian, uh, that has to do with gender and race in terms of the equality issue. But I wanna shout out to Pauli Murray, a shout out to Fannie Lou Hamer, a shout out to Shirley Chisholm who had the audacity to think about the possibility they could run to be president when you realize this country with the founding fathers, when they decided to set up shop, if I can use that term, women were not gonna be included. We came here as property and thinking about how that really had to you know, think about over the journey. So I'm sitting here thinking about the Equal Rights Amendment with the reality of like gender and also sex and how all of that kind of crosses over, if I can use that term in Kamala. What's it like to have the name of the, of the first Vice President, woman of color named Kamala. What else do I need to say? 
but I'm 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 going to say this uh, also as a grassroots organizer, and I'm I'm glad Barbara Lau is on the, on this uh, Zoom as well, and everyone else. What I've been really struck by, I'm sitting here with a demographic that I think is going to be critical moving forward, not just in terms of the state of North Carolina, but the country. And this is going to be critical. However, women, LGBTQ, you name it. Right now, 51% of the country is women. Here in my state of North Carolina, in all 100 counties, majority women. Uh, baby boomers, born between 1946 and 1964, roughly about 74 million. But those 18 to 35 year olds will soon be about 75 million, I can count. And if we intentionally figure out how we do this kind of intergenerational, multicultural way of moving this forward, I think that gives us a really um, important plus. But here's the one that I think is gonna be most essential. By 2050, if not sooner, this country will be majority people of color. I'll repeat what I just said. By 2050, if not sooner, this country will be majority people of color, keeping in mind who is already here indigenous to these lands. So as a grassroots organizer and as someone who gets, gets involved in civic engagement, I'm trying to think about how do we do that in all 50 states, the ones that we already have. I know North Carolina and other states have to also step up as well. But if we keep this in mind, I'm a little bit a, a, a dr dramatically very optimistic. Um, but also one, one other thing that I'll, I'll kind of wrap up because I really want to hear some more people um, on this call, but more importantly, what do we do moving forward? Um, Dolores Huerta had this amazing uh, statement. It was called, si, si, puede. Yes, we can. I'm looking at the history with Barack Obama, black man, son of an interracial marriage who became our president in 2008. I didn't think that would be possible. And then we just saw here in 2020, we just saw our first woman, woman of color become vice president, thinking that maybe the founding fathers never thought that that would be even possible or a frame of mind. But here we sit, what do we do with it now? So I always use this kind of interesting quote, um, like how does change happen? And I would say uh, like the changing of hearts and minds and the importance of the changing of public policy and thinking about how they are. And how do we collectively, all of us, move that forward no matter where we are? So I could just say, bring it. Let's get that ERA passed and, and, and on the book. So I'm just so happy and thrilled to be a part of this conversation. And I'll stop there and let's hear the next person. And thank you so much. Thank you, Mandy. For Barbara Lau, how did Polly Murray become involved in the ERA movement? Thank you so much, Jenny. And it's it's great to be with all of you. Um, I enjoyed watching the film again. And it is really intense to think that the second most powerful person in this country doesn't have uh, equal rights based on their gender. Um, you know, I think that obviously we're all working to try to change that. Sort of looking back and thinking about Polly Murray who grew up and was so influenced by Durham and our culture and community here in Durham. Um, so connected, you know, to that Durham history, it's, uh, it, there is some very specific connections that Pauli Murray had to this battle for the ERA and for women's rights in general. Uh, during the time that she was a law student at Howard in the 1940s was really when she started to both experience and articulate these ideas about discrimination based on her sex. Uh, she actually coined the term Jane Crow to talk about the intersection between the Jim Crow laws that discriminated against her because she was a person of color, African American, and the uh, being the only woman who lasted over the three years of her law class, understanding what the discrimination was being leveled at her because she was a woman. And so, uh, you know, she began to think about this and get much more involved in gender based rights projects after having been very involved also in civil rights. Um, as well, and coming to Howard to be a civil rights attorney. But it was in 1961 when President Kennedy formed the Commission on the Status of Women, um, asking Eleanor Roosevelt to chair this, that Polly got more specifically involved in these policy issues. Uh, she wasn't a commissioner, but she was invited to serve on the Committee on Civil and Political Rights. And in fact, the commission, according to Polly's read of it, was uh, formed to find an alternative to the ERA. Uh, majority of the commissioners were opposed to the ERA, in part because they didn't trust the all-male Supreme Court 
to uphold it, to, to give it any teeth. And there were some uh, wins on the state level uh, regarding some protections for women that some of the people on this commission, most of whom were women, uh, supported. So Polly, because Polly was an amazing legal scholar and an amazing researcher, Polly was tasked to work with a young attorney named Jane uh, Mary Eastwood to actually begin this process of understanding how laws affected people across the states related to gender. Now she had already done this related to race when she published her book in 1952, States Laws on Race and Color. So she understood this kind of research. And they then embarked on this very careful process of trying to write a final report that acknowledged the power of these laws on the state level, but kept the door open for the ERA, uh, despite the fact that many of the people in leadership uh, wanted to this report to refute the ERA as the best strategy for protecting and advancing women's rights. Uh, so Polly being a, quite a wordsmith, they worked very carefully on the final wording and their subcommittee report became what was adopted primarily by the committee. So, you know, the report was made, the, the progress was moving forward in the 1960s. And then they really saw some of this play out in the March on Washington planning in 1963, where A. Philip Randolph, who was leading that effort, chose to give the press conference for the march at the National Press Club, which did not allow women to be members. So Polly got together with a group of other civil rights, women civil rights leaders to protest this. The, the uh, fact that they were holding it at the press conference, that there were no major woman activists speaking on the dais uh, during the march, and there were no women included in the group that was gonna go meet with the president. So they, they got a few gains through that, but they weren't able to, um, to really get enough traction, uh, as much traction as they want. Um, and then once uh, Johnson was in the presidency and there was this fight for civil rights, Again, this idea of including, as we saw in the film, protecting people based on, on the basis of sex uh, was an amendment offered to the 1966, 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, I think a couple of people have mentioned Title VII. And some of the people that and, uh, supported that amendment thought it, they, this was a great idea because it would doom the entire bill, which they did not wanna pass. We heard about the Southern senators who were being obstructionists. So again, Polly and her legal strategy, her legal research was called upon to create and draft a memo for the Senate about why if, if the Senate wanted to protect black women's rights, sex needed to be added to Title VII of the 64 Civil Rights Act because a black woman wouldn't be able to say, oh, I'm just being discriminated here because of my race maybe she was also being discriminated because of her gender. So if the intent of the Civil Rights Act was to protect all black people, all people of color, then sex needed to be added to Title VII. And apparently someone who was involved in this effort also was very good friends with someone who was either the chief of staff or someone who worked on uh, President Johnson's wife's, Lady Bird Johnson's staff. So a call was made to that person, the memo was dispatched to that person who brought it to the attention of the president's wife, who also then discussed it with the president and the message came back. There is support for the Civil Rights Act as written. And in fact, the Civil Rights Act passed and President Johnson signed it into law. So in that sense, Pauli was a, um, a legal pioneer. In fact, some uh, legal scholars refer to her as the mother of the feminist legal strategy because of the analogies that she made between the protections for people based on race, which we heard in the film were high, you know, protections with, with teeth, with the high standard and protections that should be included based on sex. And I think uh, just to close, this is all very interesting and contemporary for us. And this ties together the question that Mandy was also addressing because the fact that sex is in Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act has also been used by the Supreme Court to support legal protections for LGBTQ folks. So I think as we've evolved, our conversations about sex and gender have also evolved. Gender presentation, gender identity, but the, the court seemed to be able to use uh, some of that 
to protect people based on their uh, gender presentation and their gender identity. And I would hope that as we think about the way that the Equal Rights Amendment will change the legal standard and change the way we, we operate in this country, that, that that will be quite an important umbrella for everyone. So that's just a, a sense of, um, th this was what was used recently to uh, in these Supreme Court cases. But this is just an idea of how someone like Polly Murray, who lived during the 20th century and was working at the nexus of so many of these, or, uh, these issues, really uh, clarified for us the intersectional nature of this work, that this is about protections for a lot of people um, and that, this, that we need to move this forward so that everyone, independent of their race, their gender, their sexuality, their uh, religion or national origin, has equal rights in the United States. So I know Pauli's spirit is behind all of us uh, working to pass the ERA and working to continue to improve our democracy and bring it into line with what our, uh, what our, our hopes and ideals um, have always been for it. Thank you, Barbara. We have a flood of gratitude and questions coming in on the chat, uh, but just before we get to that, we hope we're gonna answer some of those questions by asking our panelists to talk about our call to action. What many people wanna know out there is what can I do now? Um, Lori or our Kamala? Go ahead, Kamala. The first and most urgent thing that we all need to do is use um, whatever means that we have, uh, I guess mostly social media right now, to urge the new administration to call the archivist and have them publish the ERA. That really is the a priori first action without which the rest of our actions may be doomed um, to process and um, just confusion. So if we can focus on convincing the archivist to do what is simply his mandated ministerial job, which he did in Nevada, he did again in Illinois, I believe he actually has recorded Virginia. Arlene can clarify this because some people think he didn't record Virginia. He ultimately did sort of secretly record it, but he didn't go ahead and do whatever the final recording publishing of the amendment that he needs to do so that when we get to court uh, or if Congress decides to lift the amendment or declare it invalid or validate or whatever occurs that we've got this thing locked down. So that's the most important thing. Thank you, Kamala. I, I just wanted to say that Virginia is also recorded by the archivist as having ratified. And I'll just add to this, thank you, Arlene. Um, yesterday was, as Arlene had mentioned earlier, was the one year anniversary of when Virginia ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. And of course we filed our bills and we have all been working very hard. We sent out a call to action earlier about making sure that you contacted your state representatives. I'm gonna emphasize how important that is now, not just Democrats, okay, um, Republicans, that this is a bipartisan issue, that ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment in North Carolina is gonna send a strong message to men and women both. When uh, citizens, when people are considering moving to a state, they really do look at how the state treats people, how they treat um, minorities. What we saw in North Carolina a few years ago when we had the infamous bathroom bill, which uh, discriminated, um, the, the idea was that you could only use the bathroom according to the uh, gender that you were born with at birth. And it was such a, a ridiculous idea uh, that businesses refused to, to come to North Carolina, including N sub, uh, the NCAA uh, for some of the tournaments. So a lot of this is to really go back to our legislators and say, hey, North Carolina, there are over 4.2 million women that live in this state. And a lot of them have sons and daughters and they're married and equality is important to them. 
The other is that we've got to continue educating our citizens about the fact that they do not have equality, full equality in the Constitution. I talk to people every day and they say, what do you do? And I tell them and they go, what? I thought we had equality. And as, as, as uh, the Legalize Equality film showed, they don't know what it is. So it's on us as, as activists to get out there and to make sure that we are educating our friends, our neighbors, the postal worker, the hairdresser, whoever you come in contact with, that we do not have full equality yet. And here's what you can do. And I am urging everybody here from North Carolina to call, write, email your North Carolina legislator to support House Bill 8 and Senate Bill 15. Can I, can I make an observation to follow up on what Lori just said? I'm sitting here, keep on thinking about what is the kind of like correlation or relationship between women and people of color? I remember the bathroom bill. Who was the last set of people who told you can't use our bathrooms? Black folk. <laughs> and I'm also thinking about um, the irony is that when all those members of the General Assembly were going to fly home or take Amtrak, what bathroom did they use on those planes? Unisex. But it's the, it's the terminology. So I keep on trying to figure out when we have these conversations, it's, I think maybe it's like how, how you hear it or how you have examples of it and then show that we're all kind of all in this together. And of course, also the notion of language justice and thinking about how things would be in different, uh, different interpretations as well. Um, but again, I'd like to go back to what you just said, Lori, about does anyone even know who their members are over there? I have, to, I have to be honest, when I moved to North Carolina, I had not a clue. I didn't even know where the General Assembly was located. I didn't even know where our, our, city, our city hall was in downtown Durham. So I wonder if there's another layer of kind of civics 101. What would happen if we organize, go and spend one day at your city hall? I know we can't, I mean, because of COVID, but they're all virtual now. So what are some of the creative ways that we could actually get people um, knowledgeable, know who's where, how to make in contact? And I think once you have that across this country, thank you for all the ones you've already you know, um, uh, ratified. But what are there like, Lori, are there like, or Arlene, are there like 10 or 13 that have not yet? So whatever that might be, but I think this would be an incredible um, galvanizing, organized uh, campaign across the country, which would, be which would be wonderful. Just a thought though about that. Who was the last set of people told, you can't use this and you can't do that. And oftentimes it would be women and or people of color or the lesbian, mm -hmm. gay, bi, trans plus community as well. So FYI. Thank you so much, Mandy, because that you are spot on. Um, it's knowing where to find your legislators. And I, I will say that the North Carolina General Assembly, when you go to their website, they have a, it's pretty clearly marked, senators, House representatives. You can go down and find out who is there. However, North Carolina has had a little bit of a history of redistricting a lot. <laughs> I, I've lived in this, on this address for seven years. I am on my third representative and my third senator. So you think you know it and elections happen and they move things around. So take a moment and make sure all you have to do is put your address in. It will take you directly to who your legislator is. And I want to add one other thing while I, I've have the floor, so to speak, is that I heard from Representative Julie Von Hafen earlier, we just filed the House bill yesterday. And the bill was directly referred to the House Rules Committee today. Now in North Carolina, and this may be in other states across the country, it's usually where they send bills to die. So this time there wasn't even a, oh, we'll probably hear it. Um, by sending it to the judiciary. So this is where, again, it's time for North Carolina citizens to get angry, to write. And in fact, calling is great too. A lot of our legislators are working remotely as, as I'm sure some of you know, particularly their assistants, but you need to let them know you are not happy, that this is not acceptable. So it's, it's not, let's not be the sweet, polite women. We need to raise our yeah. voices and make sure they know we're not going to be we're not going to settle for this any longer in in two more years it will be 100 years since alice paul first wrote the equal rights amendment 
and it's been over a hundred years since women got the right to vote. Are we going to wait 50 plus more years in North Carolina? No. So, so I just want to um, jump in and say that um, I, I'm all for no more nice ladies, um, but also they're, they're really short and long-term strategies, right? And I think you're talking about the right now and the what we need to do right now. The other thing that's happening in North Carolina right now is a big battle over what we teach students about history and what we teach them about North Carolina history. So the new North Carolina history standards are proposing that students starting in fourth grade would begin to learn about systemic inequality and uh, really begin to understand the legacy of that in the United States. And of course, there's a huge amount of pushback because that's considered divisive and that's considered uh, you know, not the fault of these young students and that's about bringing guilt into the classroom. No, that's about truth. That is about how we got to where we are. And that is about the ways that the systems that we set up and the awareness of the systems, the legal systems, the cultural systems that we set up continue to support uh, oppression and discrimination against people based on their race, their uh, gender, their sexual orientation, their religious identity. And so that's the long-term battle, right? That's those of us who are in public history. That's the long-term battle that until we uh, continue to do a better job educating those next generations that, that Mandy is so uh, confident in, and so am I. North Carolina is also one of the fastest growing states in the United States. We're due to get an additional um, US uh, house seat. Um, and more and more people are moving here, especially during COVID, because our cost of living is more reasonable than the East Coast or the West Coast. And as more people uh, move here that are progressive, you know, we get more and more progressive and have the ability to um, shift these policies. So I agree, Lori, I you know, want us all to reach out today to those legislators to support those bills and to get that bill out of the committee or get it heard at least. Um, but I also want us to think about the long game around the way we create a more educated group of citizens who actually understand why we're here where we are. And that if we wanna lift up to the ideals of all people are created equal, you know, we have a long way to go. So my little piece, I'll get off the soapbox. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes left. And as I mentioned, a flood of questions. And I'm just gonna repeat quickly that those of you in attendance will be receiving an information document with a lot of the information we've talked about here today that you can share, refer to, and hopefully we'll answer some of your questions. And maybe some of the panelists can help with the, the Q&A. Uh, I'll start with a question from Jeanette um, Stokes. Given the Republican majority in the North Carolina General Assembly, what are our hopes of passing the ERA and NC? What would the process be? NC did not pass ERA in 1982. I guess that one comes to me, but I'm certainly Arlene or, or, or Barb or anybody of the other panels. So I have, there's a number of legislators that are on this uh, call, which I can see in the chat box. So there's a couple of things to think about. Um, back in 1982, when North Carolina voted against ratifying, um, they, they, we were on a trajectory and you know, we had 35 states quickly and what happened is the anti-ERA forces really targeted specifically the Southern states. And they did that because they also knew the Southern states hadn't ratified with a few exceptions, the 19th amendment. So uh, part of this, and I think as Barbara had mentioned earlier, there's an education level that we need to do. Now, uh, the Republicans that are currently in office we have been working closely with a representative out of Illinois, former representative out of Illinois, uh, Steve Anderson. And he has been a great source for all of us because he's helped us explain how Republicans should be behind the Equal Rights Amendment and the best way to engage with them. So part of what we hope to do particularly is we can actually go back and sit in front of people is to focus our efforts on these Republicans on why the Equal Rights Amendment makes sense, that it's more than just a bill that's going to give women full equality. It is a bill, it's a message that we're sending out that North Carolina cares about all of its citizens, 
that is going to help families in North Carolina. We actually did a program back in 2019 where we had billboards, mobile billboards going around the state capitol uh, about how the ERA is good for families. Um, even if we could get even close to pay equity in this state, the impact on our tax base, on our revenue would be astronomical. But we'd also recruit new businesses. More people would want to come to North Carolina. What we can do is watch what's happening in Virginia now. When they've ratified, they have become a more pro-equality state. We could see that in North Carolina as well. Am I optimistic? I stay optimistic. I'm going to fight. I'm going to work with the North Carolina General Assembly and with our legislators to see this happen this year. And that's all I can say is that we're, we're going to roll up our sleeves. In fact, my sleeves are already rolled up and we're going to fight. Thank you. I just want to jump in and suggest, um, which you've already said, following the Virginia model. It was so effective. And essentially, if there is a group of um, bigoted, uh, misogynistic men that are running these committees, which is what happened um, in the other states, you have to target those men specifically to remove them from office. You, you're not ever gonna be able to do it with the same guys in power um, because they actually really enjoy having this much power over a whole class of people. And so there's a lot invested in it for them to keep it that way. So I think just immediately launching campaigns to oust these people, public campaigns. We today, uh, you know, ERA North Carolina Alliance has decided to pick Joe Schmo and get him out. And that will just terrify them. Um, I think that's really the best, the most effective way that we've found at least. Thank you. A uh, question from the chat. Will someone address the concept of states rescinding? I can do that. <laughs> Thanks, Arlene. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the Constitution does not have any provision for states to rescind. Um, it's basically not a thing. So, it, you know, once it's ratified from by that state, it's done. But I, I will say that there were five states that did really try to, you know, who said they rescinded and they intervened in the DC ERA case where the three states filed against the archivist. So, um, but it's really not that much, it's not a problem because it's not a thing. That's my legal term, it's not a thing. <laughs> I like it, that's good. Um, what are the odds the ERA will become the 28th amendment to the US Constitution? 99.9%. .9%. Thank you. That's my... <laughs> uh, where can we contribute volunteering and financial contributions to support this cause? Well, I'd I like to give a shout out to Camilla. I want to give a shout out to Camilla. Her organization is amazing. They're like all over it and they can use donations and you even get a great sweatshirt if you give $50. <laughs> so um, I am just so, honestly, Pamela, I'm just so amazed with you. And, you know, I feel like you should be getting a Congressional Medal of Honor because you've done so much for so many um, And back so, at you, you, back at you, Arlene, for Arlene jumped in. We needed to write an amicus brief because our own lawyer is not allowed to write a brief in support. And we had great groups like um, like Lori's group and everybody wanting to show their support and we had nobody to write this important brief that um, sort of would detail why the ERA is important. And Arlene jumped in and she had very little time and she did it pro bono and she's been with us ever since and I'm very, very grateful to her because she explained things, explains things in a way that everybody can understand. And um, I'm so grateful to her and thank you very much. And if you do wanna to donate to equalmeansequal.org, 
All the contributions are tax deductible and we greatly appreciate it. We're all volunteer organization. We only have one staff member presently paid um, who lives in India and um, could really use continuing to get paid. So thank you so much. And I'll just put a plug in I because I, also, I, I'm sorry. I just want to also say that Gina Kalias is my baby sister and she also helped on all the briefs. And also um, she went to Carolina, I went to Carolina and my roommate from Carolina, Pam Parker, I don't know whether she's on here or not, but she's another lawyer and she helped with all of them too. So I've had help. Well, thanks, thanks Arlene. Yeah, we're gonna give a shout out to, to Gina. I'll, I'll put a plug in for the Equal Rights Amendment, ERA-NC Alliance. And I believe Audrey Mock, who is our treasurer just put um, the email address in here. We are um, completely all volunteers. Um, I retired a few years ago and in order to really dedicate uh, the next few years to working on women's issues and uh, just assumed the co-presidency this past year. And so yes, we can definitely use your help for you know mailing expenses and outreach efforts and things that we do here in North Carolina. So, um, but absolutely, that it's a huge, huge ask. And and join us, follow us. Um, I recommend that you follow the EME group. Equal means equal. They've got a wonderful newsletter. I get. We put out newsletters as well with action items. We just sent one out uh, yesterday. Um, we want to make sure that we mobilize people across the state, and that's free, but we'd love for you to join us uh, and become a member of the organization as well. Well, we have uh, attendees from all over the place. Uh, I think there was one in Germany and one from California. Um, someone suggested, well, I do want to try and be fair to our Facebook viewers, and I'm going to let uh, Kay chime in and see if there are any questions on that end. And while she's checking in with me, I'm going to ask you to drop in the chat if this is the first, you know, you've heard about the ERA. Lots of people are clearly longtime supporters, but um, if you're brand new, oh, someone from London, um, there's so much gratitude here, you guys. Uh, I hope you can, uh, we're, we're going to save the chat. Um, any questions from Facebook? Do have a question in our Q&A. Um, oh, thanks, Jeanette. Can we get an update on the lawsuits? Yes. Okay, Thank so you. there's two federal lawsuits and one is in DC and that was brought by the three states that ratified after the so-called deadline ended. Um, and so that lawsuit right now is still in what they call the trial court. It's called district court in federal in, in the federal court system. And what is right now pending is that there was a motion to dismiss the case filed. I believe that was by the interveners who are the rescission states. And, but the AGs, attorney generals, they filed a motion for summary judgment. And that means that there's no dispute as to the facts. It's just based on the law and the law is clear. And also the, that lawsuit is, a writ, is for a writ of mandamus, which is to mandate a, and a government official to do an act. And so that is you know, what that case is for. And also I just wanna say that the archivist was appointed by Obama and he had put out a press release after the, the, the Department of Justice did that memo um, telling him he could not publish. And he actually put in his thing that if if any court order told him to publish, he would do it. So that was great. Um, it's not like he's fighting doing it, you know, but the, D the Department of Justice is representing him. So now that Biden's in there, I don't even know, um, you know, they might could even settle and that would be a thing, but that's like a little bit too much trouble when all uh, President Biden has to do is pick up the phone. Now the um, Equal Means Equal case is in Massachusetts and it went through district court and lo and behold, the um, trial court judge said that um, that they did that the that women this is so incredible that women do not have standing to challenge the archivist in court we don't have the legal right to challenge it okay
okay, which is ridiculous because there is a an, uh, legal argument for standing, which is that the government is blocking the ERA. And so that's an injury. You have to show an injury. And anyway, um, I put that in the amicus for you. But so it, then it got appealed to the First Circuit Court of Appeals, which is in Boston also. And immediately, um, Wendy Murphy, who is their attorney, and, and she's seriously brilliant, honestly. I mean, I'm just, we heard her argue, do an oral argument regarding the motion to dismiss. And she's just so creative and so brilliant. And so what she did is, it, is instead of just sitting around waiting for it to do it in the First Circuit, she did um, a writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court. And which is called doing it pending the decision. So basically you jump a jump a stage and go up. So she did that. And I really thought that it was right after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. I really thought that they would take it because obviously it meets their criteria because it's a really important um, issue for the entire country. I mean, to me, it's important. It's basically the next biggest thing to desegregation of the schools. Um, but they decided not to take it at that juncture, so they sent it back down to the First Circuit. So the briefs have been filed by equal means equal, equal, the amicus brief has been filed, or amici curiae, and we have 86 groups. And they are, um, they represent their members, it's like over 2 million people. And the actual briefs are all on the blog that I put in the chat. Um, you can, there's links to them. And so we are waiting on the government to file their brief. They got an extension, so it should be coming in, I think, in a couple of weeks. Um, but that's where the that's where it stands. But if if you know, we just want the ERA. None of these people that are fighting this are trying to say, oh, we have to be we have to be the winners. You know, we're all happy if President Biden just tells Oculus to publish it. So thank you. I'm just going to add one quick thing to um, to Arlene's comment about the amicus briefs, which are amazing, the number of them that have been put together in support of the ERA. There is an amicus brief that is from 93 businesses in the United States. And these are businesses as diverse as Google, Goldman Sachs, Pfizer, hello, COVID vaccine. Uh, the NFL. So 93 businesses have signed onto this amicus brief in support of the ERA. That's another clear message that they're looking at the states, they're looking at this as good for business. We need to emphasize this as much as possible. Okay, just a couple more minutes left. Um, thank you to Jeanette at Museum of Durham History who's helping me track the questions. One is, is there a funding piece in the North Carolina legislation? Uh, yes, I believe, and I've, I know, I think I still have Representative Von Hape, I believe it's $10,000. And this is um, sort of a general funding that they put in. Uh, and that's a lot of that Yes, $10,000 for education. Thank you, Representative Von Hafen. She just popped that up in the chat. Women helping women. Um, there was a question about whether Polly Murray was involved uh, with National Organization of Women and um, Barbara was able to answer that. She was a co-founder, uh, which I didn't know. Um, it was uh, said, the story goes that she, uh, was talking with Betty for Dan and saying, we need something like the NAACP for women. And thus was born. I believe there were 66 founders and Polly was one of them. You know, she stayed with them for a while. Uh, she had some challenges with some of the racial issues inside now, but uh, the Durham chapter of now is uh, actually the Polly Murray chapter. So all those questions continue to be uh, a way for us to address some of the issues that have been really mistakes in the past around uh, dividing people uh, and beginning to take it, uh, take acknowledge the role that early feminists who are working for the vote um, had in terms of uh, racist policies and beginning to uh, try to work through those moving forward. And Barbara, uh, we need to realize that the Pauli Mur Mur Murray 
historic markers up here on West Chapel Hill Street in Durham, not far from where I live. And we did that walk in 19, 2017 to mark the 60, what was it, the 65th anniversary of the journey of reconciliation to uh, challenge the laws of about blacks in the back of the bus. We walked from that marker to the marker in Chapel Hill that marks where that bus depot used to be um, about challenging it, um, about the right to vote and right to ride on the bus. So changes. I, you know, it, it is that big picture. Um, the, Nor the Pauli Murray Center is the uh, 39th National Historic Landmark in North Carolina. There are only about 2,500 in the United States total. We're the first one in North Carolina focused on women's history, primarily focused on women's history. And that happened in 2016. So when we think about that, when we think about how much we don't respect that history, we don't it, it, it really reflects the way the general cultural attitudes about the value of women, women's contributions. We're the first and national historic landmark in the United States focused on a woman of color who's also LGBTQ. So we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that uh, what people see and understand by all the ways that we communicate that to our citizens about what's important, begin to actually reflect this bigger vision of justice for everyone. So thanks for that reminder. We, yeah, that's a state highway historic marker on Chapel Hill Street, uh, right near Chapel Hill and Buchanan. And then the Pauli Murray Center is on Carroll Street, about a block away from that near Carroll and Moorhead. And we are hoping to open that historic property in the fall of 2021. And maybe we'll be able to celebrate, uh, you know, the, the passage of the, of the amendment at the same time as we're opening the house. That would be really exciting. Awesome, thank you. Lots of people are asking about the chat and I wanna say again, we are gonna share a document with all of this pertinent information, all this good stuff. Um, I'm not sure if we can share it because of privacy. Um, there are folks' names on there. You may not mind, but some people might. Um, but we are gonna share a document with um, all the pertinent information. You're welcome to reach out to us. Um, we've got emails, we've got, uh, if you wanna add your email, if you wanna be contacted in the chat, and um, look out for that, that um, document from the Museum of Durham History. We have one more question since there have been so many and this has been such, I don't wanna make you guys go over time, but I'll make this the last question. Um, it's wonderful that more progressives are moving to NC, but with the strong history of surgical and strategic gerrymandering by Republican legislature, how will changes for the positive and just outcome actually happen? Ballot box. The ballot box, the ballot box, I'm telling you. You know, just real quick, I have some friends of mine, oh, you know, we need, the, we need the grassroots, but if you do not ignore the importance, and with that 18 to 35 year old, you just saw the importance of, and not nonpartisan, but I'm just telling you, if you do not have it, we didn't have it for women and people of color, do not waste it, use it. Thanks, Mandy. We are going to capture the chat and if you're watching and you want to capture it, there are three little dots on the right and um, you should be able to save the chat that way if you uh, really want it yourself. Um, any final comments from this amazing, wonderful, brilliant panel? Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you all and what an honor. And I want to thank the Museum of Durham History for including me. I also want to thank everybody. It's great to meet all of you. I do have to hop off to go to another uh, Zoom call, um, but it was great to be able to, in our small way, bring some of the history and Pauli Murray into the conversation. We learned so much from looking at the past about how to effectively move forward and how to avoid um, pitfalls from the past, but uh, great to meet you all. And thank you so much for mm -hmm. uh, including us. And a quick shout out, thank you. And I hope we continue this conversation and the organizing it has to happen mm -hmm. to make all this reality. And I have to hop on another Zoom call too. But thank you, everybody, and everyone yeah. who tuned in. Yeah. Check it I out. I agree. I'll echo all of that. Thank you, everyone.